We've had earlier meetings on all aspects of the challenges and opportunities confronting humanity today. We started with a topic that is often left out of these discussions, the individual. Rather than looking at the global governance, which is the topic today, rather than looking at the macrocosm, we started looking at the microcosm and asking ourselves, what is the role of the individual in the development of the society? How does the individual develop? What is, how do they accomplish in their own lives? And how do they contribute to the development, growth, uh, of evolution, of organizations, of social change, of the society as a whole? Today, we've come to the other end of the circle where we're trying to look at how the world, whatever that means, is governing itself and what are the challenges and how do we evolve as a collective organism in our processes of government. Nine months ago, we had a discussion with the Director General of the UN in Geneva, Michael Muller, who's a fellow of the Academy, uh, about doing a conference at the UN. We did one in 2013, uh, a one-day conference on what we call New Paradigm. Uh, and the theme of that is an overriding theme of all the work the Academy's been doing. Briefly described, we say that the world confronts unparalleled challenges today. Economic, social, political, we're much more conscious of the political challenges today than we were even four years ago uh, because things are changing. Ecological, of course, cultural, challenges, demographic challenges, and so forth. And we said these challenges have something in common with each other. We concluded after several years of research and a lot of discussion with different groups that none of them can be solved by individual nations on their own. All of them are interrelated with each other, so none of them can be solved in isolation from the others. And the most obvious one, I think it's already obvious, and, but uh, we cannot solve the ecological problem independently of the economic problem. And I think we're seeing today we cannot solve the economic problem without vast implications for the political, for governance. Uh, and, and politics. They are, in a sense, we have divided them because that's the way the mind works most easily, but in fact they're all intimately interrelated. It's really a whole, as Frank would say, a whole system uh, or a whole organism, whatever you want. But we also concluded none of them can be effectively addressed by the policies that are presently in place. None of them can be effectively addressed by the institutions as they are presently constituted and functioning. But more fundamentally, none of them can be effectively or fully addressed by the prevailing theory and knowledge that we have about human society, about ourselves, about the way we function, grow, develop. We need some more knowledge. And we also came to the conclusion, and we can discuss these issues, they will come up naturally in the discussion, and you're welcome to raise them at any time. But more fundamentally, we concluded, none of them can really be effectively addressed by the prevailing ways in which we're thinking. The, the thinking patterns we're using, the reductionist, uh, mechanistic thinking patterns that we divide reality into so many compartments and try to address one at a time, or we look at simply the objective uh, institutional framework and ignore the important uh, subjective dimensions, the cultural dimensions, the psychological dimensions, the perceptual dimensions uh, that are so critical. So essentially, this conclusion has guided the work and the development of the Academy over the last seven years in asking ourselves, what changes do we need to make in the way we think, and how will that changes in the way we think alter our understanding of 
each of these issues and their interrelationships with each other. So we had two, meet two of the 11 of these meetings we called courses or roundtables were on the topic of mind thinking and creativity. And they really were creative and really made us think about the way we think. Uh, and those patterns have pretty much permeated uh, most of the writing and discussion that we've been having within the academy. And I expect it will uh, during the next three days. Uh, we've also spent a lot of time looking at institutions, looking at theory. We have, for those who are not familiar, we have an international working group on what we call human-centered economic theory, which strangely enough actually has some economists in the group, but also a number of uh, uh, other uh, uh, social scientists, for those from law, from anthropology, from all different fields, because we've been trying to understand, how do you understand any particular, quote, sec segment of humanity in an integrated way in all its interconnections with the others, ecologically and politically and socially and so forth. And we found this a very fruitful uh, approach for getting new perspectives and realizing things that were not normally on the agenda when we are having a conventional discussion within one of the... And I expect that's the kind of discussion that we will have in the next three days. So we're not only trying to think differently, we're trying to look at prevailing conceptions, our social construction of reality, as Alberto reminds us in each meeting rightfully, uh, to see where we are limited by our perception and understanding of what the world is and how it works. Our economic systems, our political systems, and for anybody who was complacent about our economic uh, uh, knowledge. Uh, 2008 was a, free, a, a recent reminder that we really don't know uh, what's going on. And anyone who thought that we understood uh, uh, the science of, of politics, uh, uh, the election in 2016, and all the events that are taking place remind us we have a lot to learn. Uh, and we think we have a lot to learn, not because the economists and political scientists are not doing their job or trying hard to master, but because the very perception, the very viewpoint, the underlying thinking processes have to change if we're going to get better answers than we have with all the millions of people who have been exercising their mind on this. So now, uh, and uh, for those of you who would like to know more about the earlier meetings, they're all online. Uh, uh, we have papers, we have presentations and video for almost all of it, either at World Academy uh, or the World University Course uh, Consortium under the title of Courses. Uh, and I inv invite you to take a look at them. I, the introductory note that was circulated, I think you're all here because you agree <laughs> that these are challenging times and there are a lot of questions. Uh, and we're going to discuss those questions. I don't need to reiterate them. It's interesting for me to look back at the end of the Cold War. I happen to be working in uh, Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union, a, a lot at that time, and see uh, how radically the world has changed uh, in completely unexpectedly to at least all the people that I knew at that time uh, uh, so suddenly. Uh, one example of that was one of our board members, Alexander Lickatal, he was the uh, uh, advisor to Mikhail Gorbachev during the last two years of his presidency of the Soviet Union. And he says that in June of 1989, Gorbachev met with Chancellor Kohl of Germany, and they were discussing the future of Europe. And they both agreed that German reunification was inevitable. It was inevitable. But they both also agreed that it wasn't likely to happen until sometime, sometime in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Two years later, it was a fact. So that tells us something about the, 
the, the, the quality of the knowledge we have about the future and our capacity to anticipate. If they couldn't anticipate, uh, who could? And since then, uh, we had the, the European community really maturing into the greatest experiment, I think, ever in going beyond the nation state. And we all know the history. It was looking very bright until 2008. And now suddenly we wonder uh, what's happening to it. These are complex issues. We thought the issue of democracy was settled in the U US, if not in uh, 1789, at least after the end of the, uh, the Civil War. Uh, but we really wonder uh, about how our democratic institutions are functioning. Uh, we are more interconnected today than humanity has ever been. We're more empowered today. And though I have spoken about the challenges, it would be equally valid to have started by talking about the opportunities, because never before has humanity had the capacity to accomplish, to deliver human welfare and well-being to uh, all, of our, uh, all of our citizens as we have today. And yet we see this big gulf between capacity or opportunity uh, and reality. And we're often and mostly more preoccupied by the challenges uh, which are looming, whether they're the challenges of uh, immigration or climate change or rising inequality or in unemployment or fears about the fourth industrial revolution or then we are preoccupied with how do we systematically avail of these unprecedented opportunities. And yet, we are a human community in a way that we have never been before. Uh, and that's why the, we have, it's very important that we have anthropologists in the room, uh, because recently uh, the Academy, you'll, uh, Emil Constantinescu, our uh, member of our board of both organizations, he will be here, He's, uh, he was here yesterday, uh, he has, uh, he was the former president of Romania, uh, and a year and a half ago, the government of Romania, by an act of parliament, set up a new institution called the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Culture and Civilization of the Levant. And Emil has a very extended definition of the Levant because it goes all the way from China to, uh, uh, to most, of, uh, most of Europe, rightly so, because it's the center and notice through which humanity has been relating to itself. Uh, and uh, uh, as this is a, a World Academy organization uh, supported by the government of Romania, and we've been emphasizing that uh, in a, for a long time in our discussions, we were so preoccupied with the institutions, with the policies, uh, with the physical measures of welfare and well-being, that we didn't give sufficient attention to the underlying operating system by which all of these things work, which is culture. Uh, and now we are bringing that uh, foremost into the discussion in all of our work because we recognize how important the value systems, the perceptual systems are, and the sense of identity. And that's particularly relevant to this uh, discussion we're going to have because we see in Europe what we have known at the level of nation states. You know, nation states are not a very old organization in the history of humanity. The idea, we started out as localized communities where we identify with people who are our own genetic origin, they're our own offspring, they're our own family members, and gradually over thousands of years we've extended that to the foreigner, the stranger. Uh, the stranger in 19th century uh, England was somebody who came from the city. Beware, he's from the city, he's not one of us. You, you suspect, the rural people always suspect somebody who's uh, uh, coming from the urban areas. Or the stranger is somebody who came from France over to England across the English Channel, very suspicious. And that's been the history, and yet the history is gradually we have learned to not just gen identify with those who are, share our, gene, our, uh, our physical origin directly, but those who share our language or our religion 
or are somehow come to say, well, we belong to the same people, the same tribe, the same caste, the same class, the same nation, whatever that is, because it's really hard to define what a nation uh, really is and what constitutes it and what distinguishes it. And now we're at a stage where our sense of capacity to identify with larger groups is rapidly moving beyond the nation state uh, for, very, for so many reasons. Never before have we had so much contact with each other, so much exposure. When I was growing up uh, in uh, uh, Pl White Plains, New York, 20 miles north of New York City, we were bused uh, during junior high school, we were bused across town uh, because they wanted to integrate the school system between the, the prosperous white community at one end and the, the lower, the less prosperous black and Puerto Rican and, uh, and, and other immigrant communities at the other. And it was a culture shock uh, 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 at the age of 10, 12 uh, for that to happen. And now what's happening? <laughs> What is, the expo what is the extent of, today, uh, my uh, uh, a woman who worked with me in California, Napa, California, where we have our office, uh, when her child, children were going through high school, she said, you know, they don't even see the difference between black and white. They don't even see the differences anymore. Uh, uh, for them, there's, they're just people. And that's happening. It's happening gradually around the world. So when we're looking at this, we're not just looking at how do we get the mechanisms of the, uh, of, of the UN to work the way they're, quote, we think they're supposed to work, though they probably were never intended to work that way except by the idealists. Uh, how do we going to look at the institutions? We're not only going to look at the, the institutions of global governance uh, from the perspective that governance is government or what the nation states do. We're going to look at it from the perspective of what are all of the mechanisms that we use to govern ourselves. Whether they're laws or rights, uh, the, the collaboration between organizations, the role of, of systems. Today, you know, uh, some of the largest, most important global systems we have are not run by governments at all. They're run by businesses. We call it Google or Facebook or, uh, or, uh, or the international airline system or the international telecommunications system. Uh, so we are governed by laws, conventions, standards of, of so many types and by shared values. And we're, this is all open for discussion, from the institutional structure down to the cultural foundations uh, and values and perceptions. And we are governed by our perceptions and our theories as well. So we're taking up a very challenging topic. We don't expect to come out with answers to all the questions today in, in the next three days.